Baby, all the stars are shining bright Yeah, we should stay up So that we can look at them all night Just keep holding me, don't let me go Everything's so magical All I need is you tonight If I shut my eyes, keeping them closed All of the senses exposed You and me under the sky Let's stay up all night Give our hearts a new beginning When we fell in love Every second, every minute We were high on life Didn't waste our time Didn't sleep as much as now Let's stay up all night If you like the content, uh, I'd appreciate it if you just drop me a like and a subscription. That'd really help me out. Um, on the topic of content, obviously we're all still very much in lockdown in the UK, so um, there's not much we can do. The video that you're watching playing at the moment is uh, just some old footage of me riding around. Um, but one thing I thought I could talk about today is uh, just to walk through the timeline and the history of some of the bikes that I've owned and what happened to them. There's some, <laughs> there's some quite funny stories in there, so I, I thought I might make a bit of just short video. Um, so yeah, without uh, further ado on that, I started off at 16. Uh, I got a job. I left school and decided not to bother with college for one reason or another. I, I had to go to work basically. Um, I went to work in a local meat pie factory. And don't ask. <laughs> but I needed to get there and bike and it was winter time so I actually bought a, a DT50. I uh, did a CBT and bought a DT50 uh, and rode that bike to and from that meat pie factory for about three months. Um, I fell off that bike at least four times. The, the worst story I have about that bike was uh, I'd been to the chip shop, and I remember I'd been to the chip shop and I'd got a kebab and chips wrapped up, stuffed into my into my denim jacket. And I was waving at people outside the pub I knew, and then realised I needed to turn left immediately after the pub. Jumped on the front brake, with no experience about riding bikes at all just washed the front out in front of everybody stood outside the pub. They were clapping and cheering and laughing. I was like, oh, this is tremendous. I got kebab, squashed kebab all over me, all down my jeans and oozing out of my denim jacket and everything. So that was a real hoot. <laughs> so so I, I, uh, I turned 17 and ended up getting a car and the bike got swapped for a car and then I couldn't afford a bike really until I turned 21. Uh, I was fortunate to have a job at that time where I had a company car, so um, I was able to use the money I would have spent on a car for a motorbike. So I did a direct access test. Um, for those of you that don't know, in the UK you can do two sorts of tests. Uh, you can either do a test on a 125cc and then be restricted, or you could do your direct access test on a 500cc, I think it was at the time. And if you passed on that, you could literally just go out and buy anything R1s, Fire Blades, Ducatis whatever you want, which is a bit nuts actually, thinking about but um, that's what I did. So I passed my test on a uh, 500 but I'm actually convinced, just a side note, it's actually convinced I failed my test. When you do your test on a 500cc bike, they're always drilling into you that the instructors are wanting to see that you can quote, quote, make progress. So for example, if there's an overtake that presents itself, they expect you to go for that overtake confidently, safely obviously, but they will need to see that you can handle that sort of power. So that's been drilled into you all the time. So I remember pulling out this Doncaster test station. So pulling out a Doncaster test station, you sort of pull out and turn left onto there's a dual carriageway, but I was super nervous and I wasn't looking far enough in front of me. That dual carriageway actually extends uh, for about 100 meters and then uh, merges back into one lane. So what I did, I pulled out onto the dual carriageway, saw a car in front of me, just trundling along like 30, clearly slowing down for the merge. I thought, right, make progress gassed it, went round the car and left the instructor behind the car. So I lost, I lost the instructor in the first 15 seconds of my test. Anyway, so I, I sort of uh, pulled in, 
did all the right things, mirrors, signal, mirror, all that stuff, checked that he wasn't there. And then he caught me back up, and all the way around the test, I'm like, you absolute muffin, you failed this. And the only thing that I was actually really worried about in the test was the U-turn. Because I'd completely written that off already, I just sort of whipped the U-turn round without thinking about it. Wanted to get back and just get home and cry into my pillow. And then the U-turn was so easy because I wasn't thinking about it. I actually got back and passed the test, um, which was quite staggering. But anyway, I digress. So, so yeah, I passed my test. Went out for immediately uh, at Kawasaki ZX6 on Ninja J1 2000 when they were updated. Um, I, I, that was my first ever sort of proper bike. Uh, absolutely love that thing. Some amazing memories on that. First knee down experience on the A57 roundabout. <laughs> um, just brilliant bike. I uh, unfortunately crushed that bike though. The, uh, it wasn't my fault, not this time anyway. It's, um, just riding around some twisties, kind of committed into a corner. Not going too crazy, but some uh, some boy racing chap in a no breast R. I remember it now, I remember the look on his face. He came flying around the, the, uh, the opposite side of the road, right across the middle of the road, like driving like an absolute idiot. But as I said, I was in the corner, committed to it, and all I could do is kind of brake um, and, and try and adjust the steering a little bit. And obviously, uh, I uh, just went too far, and I, I, to avoid him, I ended up crashing, basically, I lost a front end. Ditch and that's the end of that one really. Um, it wasn't that bad, I repaired it, but I, I, I wanted to sell it. So I sold that and bought what was probably looking back now my favourite ever bike. Bought a 2001 K1 GSXR 600. An absolute tool of a bike that was. Loved it. Just made me feel like an absolute hero. Completely stable, fast, raw, noisy, brilliant thing. I uh, took that to Donington, Cadwell, all over the place. Never crashed that once, surprisingly. Amazing. Um, but yeah, kept that one a while. Unfortunately, that, that one was a victim of his own success, really, because it made me feel like a much better rider than what I actually was. So I swapped that for a 2002 R1, um, of which you will uh, see the ending of that bike right now. That, um, that bike intimidated me, honestly. There's no electronics. I was I wasn't experienced enough to ride that bike or handle that bike properly. Um, and I could I could definitely go way quicker on that Suzuki than I could on the R1. But um, I like the bike. It was a gorgeous looking thing. Um, and at the time, it was like you know the bike to have. I remember riding. Um, but yeah, so I, I as you see what happened to that bike, I then swapped that for the first model of the new CBR 600 RR. I, I want to say it was late 2003, it might be 2004. Uh, no, 2003, definitely. The one with the under seat exhaust, here's some pictures. Um, again, I liked that bike, that was great. It uh, wasn't quite as exciting as a Suzuki, but it was a brilliant bike, good looking bike as well. I managed to drop that one at Donington, I ran off a coppice um, into the, the kitty litter there. Quite innocuous one, that one. But I came up on quite badly actually. I think it's called Chris Kerr. It's the when you're going down the back straight at Cadwell Park and you then you break into the right hander, whatever that corner is, sure it's Chris Kerr, I'll check that. Um, I lost the front there going in too deep and uh, you know did a few barrel rolls and fractured ankle, fractured rear. Bike was okay. Um, but really that was sort of the beginning of the end of me for bikes for a while. I swapped the red one for a black one. Um, uh, I had the black one for a while, but then I sort of came into a period of my life really where I couldn't afford to have bikes, I needed to move out, and I, I couldn't afford to have a, a bike and a car, and needed to buy houses and be sensible, and kids, and blah blah blah, basically. So, all that happened, uh, and then we come to where we are now, really. So, I've got the, the ZX6R now, the brand new one. Um, great bike, love it. I uh, feel so much better riding bikes now, but. As I've said before, I'm going to use this year on the ZX6R to get back up to speed. Got a load of track days planned when we eventually get out of lockdown. They'll not go anywhere, though. I'll still do the same amount of track days, they just might be a bit more condensed. Um, I'm going to finish off the year in Jerez on that bike on the ZX6R. Got three days booked in Jerez. Touch wood that won't get cancelled. And then when I come back from that, I'll be making a decision on what 1000 uh, 1100cc bike I'm going to get. It's really between the R1, the V4S, and the new 1100 factory from Aprilia. Looking back again, I've, I've re-reflected on the BMW, and although it was an amazing road bike, it just didn't excite me at all. The old R1 I had in 2002 was way more exciting. I think maybe that was a lot to do with no electronics, and you thought it was going to kill you, but still, 
the BMW is brilliant, but just a bit boring, to be honest. Um, so yeah, the R1M, the Aprilia, and the Ducati, you know, a lot of it's about the noise. Um, but that's what I'm gonna do over Christmas this year, and then next year we will see how we get on with those bikes. Um, to be honest, if I had to put a quid on it now, my gut feels telling me that the Aprilia is the bike to have. Uh, it's 10 grand less than the Ducati, and I don't think it's 10 grand less bike. And I think, this is obviously uh, everybody's own opinion, but I think it sounds better as well. Um, so yeah, anyway, so look, Thanks all for sticking around. Again, look, not necessarily the content that I want to put out, but I think sometimes, you know, it's good to understand where I've been and where I've come from, and maybe some people would be interested in some of the old food stuff. I had a quick laugh at me about the kebab and the chip chop incident, or laughed at me falling off at Donington back in the on the R1. Um, so yeah, look, it's a bit of content for you in these boring times at the moment. I hope you appreciate it. Uh, if you do, if you could leave me a like and a subscription, it really would help me out a lot. And uh, uh, I'll try and find something to bring you uh, content wise for the next video um, and you know hopefully we can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel getting out of this lockdown and getting back on track so take care everybody look after each other look after your families and uh, see you soon cheers I'm seeing in this